Well, welcome to church. Good morning. My name's John. I'm the pastor here, and thank you for coming out to church today. Good for you guys. I had a friend of mine send me a list of different things that can extend your life, and there was nine different things on this list put out by um, a medical research group, and it talked about how reducing stress can add a year to your life, and eating healthy and exercising can add like two or three years to your life. And uh, what was most interesting is at the very bottom of the list, it said weekly involvement at a religious organization. And uh, uh, that added 14 years to your life, which was really interesting to see. So a lot of people are like, you know, I don't have time to go to church. And I'm always like, dude, you, you, you can't afford not to go to church. You get more time. 14 years, apparently, by going to church. That's pretty cool for an hour on Sunday morning. Well worth it. So uh, welcome, Wheatfield, DeMont, Hebron, online, and of course, Jail. Good to be here with you guys. And uh, I want you to know that no matter what happened yesterday, no matter what happened last night, you're welcome here today. This is a place where no one's perfect and everyone's welcome. And our hope is that you'll leave with practical, helpful handles on what you can do to love Jesus more and better in your life. And uh, we're in the second week of this teaching series called Divine Direction. It's all about learning God's will and direction for your life. Last week, we laid the foundation and we said, the key to learning God's personal will for for your life is learning his divine and moral will. And you remember we had the bowling alley, the divine will kind of represented the gutter, the moral will represented the gutter, and the personal will is everything in between that. And uh, we said order really matters. The personal will of God is not revealed to us first, only by knowing the moral will and the divine will of God do we begin to learn his personal will for our life. And our key passage for the whole series really lays this out for us clearly. It says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, don't look for his personal will. Do not depend on your own understanding. Don't look for his personal will first for your life. Instead, seek his will, his divine and moral will in all that you do. And then, and then he will show you which path to take. He'll show you his personal will. And the more clearly you know God's divine and moral will, the more clearly and imminently you'll learn his personal will for your life. And if his personal will is not clear, we say it's like a little warning light in your mind that kind of reminds you, hey, you need to seek God more in your life. I think most of us have a pretty good idea what the, the moral will of God is. A lot of us, you know, even if you didn't grow up in church, you kind of know like, okay, don't lie, don't steal, you know, sex in God's context, whatever. But the divine will, that's something I need to talk about. We're going to do that in future week, weeks because I know a lot of us, this is what our lane looks like. We know the moral will of God, but there's a whole 90 degrees here where we don't really know the divine will and it's difficult. And I shared with you before, I believe that my dad um, raised our family, my brother, and, 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 and also my mom with, with a great understanding of the divine will of God. And it allowed us to see the personal will of God in our life in a unique way. So in two weeks, I'm going to talk about what the divine will of God is super, super clearly. It's going to be a good message. Make sure to mark your calendars for that. I'm really excited about it. But this week, I want to talk about something different. It's really important. And that is the question, what are we really bowling for? Right, what are we really bowling for? I mean, what do these pins represent in our life? And I think that's the big question for so many of us. Okay, divine will, moral will of God, but there's pins at the end of the lane. We gotta talk about that. Like, what do these things represent? And I really believe that as Christians, the pins represent God's grace, for sure. We're bowling for God's grace. That's what I wanna talk about today. And I shared with you the other day, I went bowling as a family, we'd fill lanes, it was fun. I'd like to share again that my team did win. Is that relevant to the message? No. Is it important to me to share the one time in my life where I actually defeated Kristen in something? Yes. Because when you get married and you're a man, you pretty much always lose. No, just kidding. You win all the time. But um, I win every day. I just lost right there. Bad. But anyway, um, one thing that happened in the middle of the game is my one and only son, sweet baby boy Eldon, trundles up to bowl. And I realize he's in the wrong lane. And he's about to let the ball go in the wrong lane. And I run up there and in his backswing, I catch the ball and I pull it back. I say, Eldon, that's, that's the wrong lane. But I totally get how he ended up doing it because all the lanes look exactly the same, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to tell them apart, but he almost went for the wrong set, the wrong set of pins. And I've actually done this a few times in my life bowling. I bowled quite a bit, especially in my younger years. And I remember once getting a strike in the wrong lane. And I was so excited. I was like, yes, yeah, strike, you know what I mean? But then the automatic scorekeeping machine did not show like the little animation of getting a strike because I bowled in the wrong lane. And it made me really angry because obviously the points didn't count. And it was like, dang it, you know, I got a strike, it didn't count. Um, later on this day, we were sitting watching, you know, the kids bowl, everybody's taking turns. And if you ever been to Wheatfield Lanes, the uh, seats are staggered, right? They have seats kind of staggered there. And we're sitting in what we thought was the correct seats. But this other family shows up, and I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but they're kind of like sitting there, like looking at us awkwardly, and they're looking at like a ticket or something and whatever. And all of a sudden we realize, oh, we're sitting, we're sitting in the wrong lane. 
It's amazing how confusing and easy it is to end up in the wrong lane. I think this happens to a lot of people in a lot of different contexts. I think this happened to Paul, the greatest pastor and church planner of all time. Some of you guys know, you know, uh, the, the story of Paul as a pastor and as a church planner. A lot of people don't know his origin story. Paul was called to follow Jesus in a pretty dramatic way. I mean, he was on this road traveling to the city called Damascus, and, and, and Jesus literally appears to him on the road and calls him to be a Christian. But before Paul became a Christian, I just want to read to you what he was like in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul, now in the olden days, when you would choose to follow Jesus or you had a big life transformation, you would symbolize that life transformation by getting a different name. So he used to be called Saul before he was a follower of Jesus. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and requested letters addressed to to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. That's what they call Christianity in the Bible, followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So this dude was a, a devout Jew who really thought he was doing the right thing. He really thought, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. He's arresting, persecuting, and sometimes even killing Christians. And I think the big important question to ask, when somebody is doing something bad, the big question to ask is, is why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? And a lot of times the answer, when we have somebody who's doing something we don't understand, we don't like in our life, what do we assume? We, we say, they're doing it because they're mean. We're doing it because they're terrible. We're doing it because they're a supervillain. We're doing it, they're doing it because they're evil. But nobody wakes up in the morning and is like, you know what? I'd really like to be the next Hitler. I would like to be going down in history as, as the supervillain. That's what I really want. No one wakes up saying, I want to waste my life on things that are the wrong cause. The reason why we do the things we do, the reason why people in your life are antagonizing you is because they actually think they're doing the right thing. In a twisted sense, they think they're doing the right thing. And this is what I want you to get about Paul. He was doing what he was doing because he thought he was serving God. That's why he was persecuting Christians. He thought he was bowling down the right lane. He thought he was right in between God's moral will and God's divine will. He looked at these Christians who were doing horrible things like dignifying women and valuing science and reason and emancipating slaves and disagreeing with the religious establishment. And he really thought that he was doing the right thing. And Paul thought that he loved God. He thought that he knew the Bible and, and he knew the moral will of God. He thought that he knew the divine will of God. But here's the thing, and this is so critical. It's the main point of today's message. I want you to get this. Somehow, just like Eldon, he was bowling in the wrong lane. Instead of bowling for the pins of grace and reconciliation, he was bowling in the lane next door. And the problem is the lanes surrounding God's lane for our life, they all look similar. They have a similar divine will, similar moral will, similar but different pins. And I think a lot of us as Christians, we end up doing this. We end up bowling in the wrong lane. We think that we love God. We think that we're doing the right thing, but somehow we just, we've messed up our view just a little bit. We twisted the divine will. We twisted the moral will. We end up in the wrong lane with the wrong pins. This was Paul. He was bowling in the wrong lane. So I think the big question is, what is the right lane? You go to the bowling alley of faith and you look at all these lanes, it's like, well, which one's right? They all look pretty similar and how do I know and where's the right lane? And I wanna talk about that for a minute, the right lane of Christianity. We're gonna lay it out pretty simply. For some of you, you'll know this. Others of you, it's gonna be like, oh, that's really good. For all of us though, I think it's important. Romans 3, 23, it says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious Standards. Now that sounds like kind of lame, like, oh, God has these really high standards, but um, God does have standards for our life because he loves us. Obviously, I have standards for my son, Eldon, right? One of my standards is I don't want him to bowl a bowling ball in the wrong lane because I want him to score points. Why? Because I love him. If I did not love him, I'd let him miss out on scoring points. I'd just let him do whatever he wanted. I'd let him screw up other people's games. I'd let him look like a fool in front of everybody in his life. I'd let him waste the game of his life on things that don't count. But because I love him, I correct him, right? Sometimes he doesn't like that. You know, his five-year-old self is like, Dad, why would you correct me? You know, I want to be free. I want to do whatever I want. I'm going to kick and scream and love his love, Dad. And don't you understand? I love bowling in the wrong lane. Can't you allow me to do that? Someday from a 15-year-old perspective, he might yell at me. He might be mad at me, but I'm a yelling, or I'm a yelling father. I'm a loving father. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a yelling father too. And in the same way, God is a loving heavenly father. And he loves us. And we, like Ellen, Inevitably, inevitably fall short of God's glorious standards. We end up bowling in the wrong lane. But instead of not loving us, instead of abandoning us to our own devices, it says, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. 
He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the keyword penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Two key words here, penalty and sacrifice. Let's talk about penalty for a moment. In the bowling alley, if you bowl in the wrong lane, you'll ruin other people's games. And if you don't quit, you say, you know what, this is the lane I want to bowl in. I don't care what they told me, I'm going to bowl in this lane. Eventually, somebody's going to have to pay for that game, right? Because your bowl ends consequence. You're going to have to pay for that game. You might even get kicked out of the bowling alley. In other areas of life, a mistake, say at the gun range, the cost of the mistake could be much higher. There are consequences for all the mistakes we make in life. In the kingdom of heaven, sin has a big consequence. It ruins the nature, the perfection, and the holiness of heaven. So we cannot be in heaven if we have sin. The penalty of sin is that we can't be in heaven with God because our sin would ruin the holiness of heaven. That's the penalty of sin. That's the consequence of sin. That's the first point. Secondly, there's a penalty, but God pays for the issue. He goes to the front desk and he says, hey, my children, they've messed up these games. I'll pay for the price. I'll pay for it. I'll take care of it. I'll sacrifice for it. And rather than yelling at us, rather than kicking us out, he just, he takes care of the issue himself. He takes care of the consequences. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 puts it this way. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it's grace. God takes care of the justice and he gives us grace. In the lane we bowl down between God's divine will and God's moral will has the pins of grace at the end of it. It's grace, it's grace, it's grace. This is the lane of Christianity. And here's a big point, and this is what I really want you to get today again. Christians bowl in the wrong lane for the wrong pins all the time. We are so susceptible to this. It's so easy to do. And the thing about bowling in the wrong lane is that you don't realize you're bowling in the wrong lane. You think you're bowling in the right lane. In fact, you really, really think you're doing the right thing. Just like Paul, I mean, he's so passionate and he's persecuting Christians and he thinks, oh man, this is the right thing to do. I'm really doing the right thing. People bowling in the wrong lane don't know about it. It's one of the biggest problems in Christianity. And I know a lot of you are like, I hope my person is really listening to this. I hope my wife, I hope my husband, I hope my son, my daughter, my mother-in-law, whatever. I hope so-and-so is really listening. But that's what everybody in the wrong lane would say, right? We, we don't realize we're doing it. We're, oh, I hope this is about them. No, no, no. This message, all the messages, sermon, God's word, it's all about us. Bowling in the wrong lane is a huge tragedy because your efforts are wasted. And ultimately, when you're bowling in the wrong lane, your pins don't count on the scoreboard of eternity. You waste your life. You waste your life. Despite trying as hard as you can, the problem with bowling in the wrong lane is it leads to a profound sense of unfulfillment. I think this is a big problem in Christian circles. There's so many of us, we try really hard. We're really trying to follow Jesus and we're so unfulfilled. And I think it's because we're bowling in the wrong lane. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about three wrong lanes that I think Christians get caught up in. The first two are gonna take a little bit. Some of you are gonna relate to the first two. I know all of you will relate to the last one. Again, the middle point might take a little longer than the rest of them. But the first wrong lane that we bowl down is... Uh, to the right of the main lane, and it's, it's called legalism, the lane of legalism. And here's what legalism does, is it exchanges the pins of God's grace for a new kind of pin called the pins of perfection. Right, instead of saying, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace in my life, it says, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna be perfect, and I don't need God's grace. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna live for God's moral will. And I think, in some other ways, this lane replaces the divine will of God for two moral will of God gutters. And it makes the gutters a little bit wide so that the, the, the personal will of God in your life in the lane of legalism is super, super narrow, super, super difficult. Some of you didn't grow up in a church like this and you don't really know what I'm talking about, but others of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The lane of legalism keeps score by seeing who can act the most Christian. It's not about God's grace. Now it's about perfect Christian living. This is why, you know, in the lane of legalism, it's like, well, you have to wear the right clothes. Men gotta wear suits, women gotta wear skirts all the time. Sometimes it's things like not listening to music with a beat in it or not dancing. Sometimes it's you gotta do the right translation of the Bible. It's a 1611 KJV only and that's it. Sometimes it's doing expository verse by verse messages. Sometimes it's only inductive Bible study. Sometimes it's if you don't say this specific thing at the start of the service and it's not and you always have to explain and this is what Jesus and if you don't and then it, or um, our church can fall into this too. Right, I mean, every church is susceptible to legalism. You know, sometimes it's like, well, only a church that does, you know, fancy lights with great music where, you know, you could bring somebody far from God and have them be filled with life in Christ. And if it's not done that way, and, it's, and that's the only way to do it, and if you don't, then you're not a good church. And every Christian and every church is susceptible to this lane of legalism. It's just one lane over. And I've had people tell me this kind of funny story. Grant Allen, our worship director, has actually had the same story. But um, I've had this story happen in my life where I'll have people come up to me, multiple times I've had people come up to me and tell me, Pastor, 
I've broken all 10 commandments, right? And that's their fancy way of telling me that they murdered somebody, okay? I've done, right? Because a lot of the other commandments, you know, I mean, look, 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 covet, you know, steal, whatever, like people have done that. But, but you know, thou shalt not kill. That's, that's kind of the, the worst one, right? Well, Pastor, I've broken all 10 commandments. But both Grant and I, one time in my ministry, I've had someone come up to me and say, but I've never drunk the devil's juice, which is a Baptist way of saying alcohol. And I'm always like, really? Like you've murdered somebody? But when it comes to alcohol, that's like the one thing you wouldn't do. You know, I mean, the Bible doesn't even call alcohol a sin. It just, it says that alcohol in moderation is okay, but don't get drunk, right? And it's like, you didn't, your priorities are way messed up. And what is that? That's legalism. What does legalism do? It makes, it makes the moral will of God super, super wide, right? It makes the personal will of God super, super narrow. Everybody's susceptible to legalism. And today, there's, there's new, there's every generation has a new form of legalism, right? When I was a kid, it was, you know, music and video games or whatever. Today, it's like, if you don't wear a mask, then you're not a loving Christian. If you do wear a mask, then you're not a loving Christian. If you don't get a vaccine, then you're not a loving Christian. If you get a vaccine, then you're not a loving Christian. I mean, it's just, it's new forms of legalism all the time, right? And we do this thing, we define and these things that aren't even in the Bible. We just make this new secret moral code and you have to do this and this is how you're made right with God. And if you don't do these things, you're not made right with God because we replace the pins of grace with the pins of perfection. And churches and Christians that do this, there is no end to this. There is no satisfaction in this. Instead of grace, mercy, compassion, and second chances, church becomes a place where everybody's perfect and no one's welcome, right? You're terrible and you're awful and you're evil. If you don't do these things in this way and you're a bigot and you're this and you're terrible and awful and you don't even value and you're not American. And there's a big difference between calling someone to repentance, which is good and loving, and condemning someone. And this lane has a tendency to condemn. And I'm bold in this lane, personally. And the problem with the lane of legalism is it feels really good because it's like, I know the score and I'm doing really great and I can do this and, you know, I can love myself because I'm a good person because I do these things. And, and it feels good because you can compete with others. You know what I mean? It feels really good because, you know, I know where I'm at, but the problem is it's so fleeting because instead of bowling for the pins of grace, when we deny our sin, we end up yelling at others. We alienate ourselves from others, blocks intimacy. That's what bowling for the pins of perfection does. And it's the wrong lane. And it's so, so easy to end up in the lane of legalism. Some people have been hurt by churches like this. Some of you, you grew up in a, in a scenario like this, and if that's you, one, I know how that feels. I've been on both sides of the lane of legalism. And I'm just sorry. That's not who Jesus is. It's the wrong lane. Second lane I want to talk about is on the left side, and it's very similar. It's like a mirror image of the lane of legalism, and it's the lane of progressivism, the lane of progressive Christianity. And instead of the, the pins of grace, this lane has a different kind of pin of perfection. The, 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 the pin of woke perfection. And it's very similar to, to the, the pins of the lane legalism. I got an email from a church leader the other day. And uh, he was calling Christian leaders to pray and work for justice and reconciliation. And the email basically said, if, if you don't pray and work for and believe in justice and reconciliation, you're a bad person. And um, listen, listen, that sounds really good. I mean, justice, so good. I want, who doesn't want justice? I want that. Reconciliation, so good. Who doesn't want that? The problem is, this is not the core of Christianity. This is a perversion of Christianity, and it's also nonsense, because here's the thing. Justice does not lead to reconciliation. Justice leads to separation, right? Jesus got justice by being separated from God the Father as he took sin upon himself. Justice is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? I've never seen anybody be like, hey, you know what? I'm, you stab my eye out, so hold still. I've got this all, and I'm just going to hammer it into your pupil real quick, okay? I'm going to gouge that out there, and now we're friends. Let's hug. We made it up. You know what I mean? Like, that's good. I'm so glad that we had justice. Like, justice leads to separation. Gandhi said, eye for an eye, and the world goes blind. The core of Christianity is not to fight for justice of the oppressed. It's that we receive grace and admit that we're all oppressors. Red, red, brown, black, and white, we're all oppressors because of sin in our life. But by the grace of Jesus, we can be redeemed and reconciled to one another. Justice doesn't lead to reconciliation. Grace does. Our lane is to forgive and give grace because we've received it from Jesus. And I think in Christianity, we have this whole movement of bowling in the wrong lane for equality and justice. We're not the saviors of the world. We're not purveyors of justice and vengeance and reparation. That's literally God's job. Paul lays it out here pretty clearly in Romans. He says, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. And he doesn't say that the, the, the justice is a bad thing. He just says it's, it's God's job. If you're trying to be a purveyor of justice, you're literally doing God's job. Think about it this way, World War I, okay? Um, Germany is defeated. And the allies say, hey, you need to pay reparations. That's the just thing to do. You need to pay back the whole world for the problems that you caused. And you, right? Did justice lead to reconciliation? No. It led to World War II. And at the end of World War II, fortunately, some within the allied powers learned, hey, 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 instead of making Japan 
And Germany and Italy pay reparation, which would be the just thing to do. We don't want World War III. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna forgive and rebuild. Was that just? No, it was wrong. Was that the right? No, it wasn't the just thing to do, but it led to reconciliation. So here's the thing, justice isn't bad. It's just not our job. Our job is grace. Justice is God's job because when we fight for justice, everybody goes blind because we've all sinned. And everybody gets canceled. And we get censored by the secret police and the Gestapo and the YouTube algorithm and whatever else because we're all sinners and we all have a past. And suddenly when we're fighting for justice, what do we do? We're re-adjudicating everybody's tweets that they made when they're 15. And it's like, he needs to step down and she needs to resign and they have to be canceled. And, they have to, and that's what justice and reconciliation leads to. They don't go together. And I've lived in this in my life. And I think part of the reason why as your pastor, and I've not shared this before with the church, but part of the reason as your pastor, I'm so passionate about this particular issue is uh, it represents one of the darkest moments of my life. That girl that I dated, that I shared about last week or the week before, she, um, she loved this lane of social justice. I think that's part of why she wanted to date me because it, it was woke to have you know, her dating someone like me. She loved the lane of social justice. She loved pointing out how terrible the system was. And I remember joining her protesting and yelling in a broken system. And I wanna be clear, it feels really good to protest and yell. It made me feel really good about myself. It made me feel a sense of superiority, calling people racist and, and fighting for a broken system. But you know what? It led to separation, not reconciliation. It was the opposite of the values I was taught as a child in my household. And ultimately, it made me arrogant and narcissistic and a not correctable person. And ultimately, it chased the things of God and the fruit of, spirit, fruit of the Spirit out of my life. Instead of having grace for others, I became super hateful of others calling out other people's hate. That time with that girl is the darkest moment of my Christian life. And it's because I was bowling in the wrong lane. Instead of going for the pins of grace, I was bowling for the pins of, of this new woke perfection. Christians, instead of fighting for justice, we forgive and we ask for forgiveness. Instead of demanding justice and reparation, which is fundamentally unchristian, and they don't go together, we receive grace from Jesus and we give grace to others and we ask for it back from them. And this is where the world is reconciled to one another. This is the legacy of Christianity. And so many Christians have fallen into this wrong lane here, the lane of progressive Christianity. And the big problem in the church, it used to be legalism, but I think we've just flipped over to a new form of legalism. It's the wrong lane. And instead of reconciliation with God and with people, which is what Christianity is supposed to produce, the lane of progressivism and justice produces polarization, fragmentation, condemnation. Justice does not produce reconciliation. It produces separation. And I want to be clear here. Um, I think people on both the right and the left are in this lane. I think people, I mean, it's so easy to look at others and say, you need to do this, or if you don't, and da 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 and I know a lot of us see it right now. This lane is so tempting. The allure of it is so real. And again, when you're bowling in the wrong lane, it's easy to be like, well, they need to hear this. But are we bowling in that lane? The last lane I want to talk about is the lane of prosperity, the lane of fun and success. And uh, this lane has the right moral will of God. It's got the right divine will of God. You really look like a Christian when you're in this lane. You're in the person will of God. It's all good. But it just, it replaces the pins of God's grace really subtly with, with the pins of prosperity. Right? And instead of the goal being receiving the grace of God and passing that to the world, it's like, I want to follow God because it leads to my best life now. I want to follow God because, I mean, statistically, you know, it leads to the highest level of relational satisfaction, the highest level of sexual satisfaction. And I want to follow God because, you know, in my life, and it can do all these things for me, and it can add 14 years to my life, and that's why I want to follow God. People in this lane, it's like, man, I love God's promises so much, and we think about going to heaven. It's like, man, I'm so grateful because when I go to heaven, I'm going to get to see all my relatives, streets made of gold, you know, dogs, everything. You know, I just can't wait, and I want this so bad, blah, blah, blah. I want to see. And we describe heaven, we never even talk about Jesus being there. Right, because we don't really love God. We just, we love what he might give to us in our life. God is here to give me a fun and successful life now. And the more faith I have in God, the more God will bless me in this life. And that's what we think. It's called the lane of prosperity. It's not right. Because I mean, obviously the apostles loved God and their life on a material level wasn't super blessed. We're not here to have a good life for ourselves. We're here to give the grace of God that we've received from him to the world around us. And the problem with, with the lane of prosperity is that there's no win in it. No matter how much you get, this life is still fleeting and we're still separated from God. And when you get back from a trip to LA, when you get back from a trip to Vegas, a trip to Hawaii, whatever, and you have this great time and you get the hair extensions and the lip injections and you get the pole barn full of boats and, and guns and whatever else. And you know, you, God restores your marriage because you're following his plan and he restores your relationship with your kids and whatever else. When you're in the lane of prosperity, it's never enough. You just, you just want more. There's no satisfaction. You just want more. 
And I think the other problem is if, if your goal is to follow God because his promises lead to your best life now, um, when life doesn't go well, your faith dies. And that to me is the big sign of bowling in this lane is a faith that's just up and down and up and down. You know, I mean, I love God so much and, da, 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 and I'm following his plan and I've been single for a whole year. God, I'm gonna not follow your plan anymore. It's just a roller coaster ride up and down based on life and distraction. This lane calls to me all the time. All the time, like it's tempting. I even think in my preaching, I get, I get torn off track because, you know, following God, his wisdom really does work and statistically all these things and that is really motivating, but I want our, our motivation to be reconciliation with God, first and foremost, spiritual reconciliation with God. That's what the church is about, the grace of God in our life so that the bridge between us and God is healed because of Jesus. The lane of prosperity is so tempting. You know, I think, oh man, it would be so nice and if I could just, you know, and whatever, and maybe I could have gone into business and instead of having a 1993 ski boat, I could have a 2000. 20 ski boat, that'd be sweet. And every time I've gotten what I've wanted, it's always been empty. It's always fleeting because this is, this is not the right lane. So I think the big question that people ask is how do you know if you're bowling in the right lane? First, I want to talk for a moment about what the wrong lane feels like. And there's four things. When you're bowling in the wrong lane, this is what it feels like. Number one, the pins don't count. You're bowling and it feels like nothing counts. You're doing it. It's like, man, this doesn't, this doesn't, doesn't. And there's yelling about a broken scoreboard. This isn't right, and, da, 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 and this scoreboard, and I bowled a strike, and it didn't count, right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna invalidate everyone else's scores. Well, you're not doing it right. You have to do it my way, because the scoreboard, and da, 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 and you gotta come over to my thing, and my way, and whatever, and you'll never be satisfied when you're bowling in the wrong lane. We all know people who are like this. When we're bowling in any of the wrong lanes, a lane of progressivism, the lane of legalism, the lane of prosperity, we have everything, but we're angry at everyone. We live in this wonderful life in the best country in human history during the most prosperous time in human history, but it feels like the cards are stacked against us. Everything is an outrage. Like, oh, can you believe it? How dare they? And everyone's out to get me and I just can't believe it. And everyone's corrupt and the system's broken and I'm just so upset. And um, you feel like they're doing it on purpose. You feel like they conspired, right? Like, I mean, they did it on purpose. They woke up this morning, they planned it and they're deceptive and they did it to hurt me and I can't believe they would. And how could they and how would they? And the wrong lane makes you feel like everybody, everybody's a sociopath. Everybody's out to get me. Everybody's a narcissist. The irony is that the wrong lane does that to you because you're the one looking at every, you're the common denominator in all those relationships. We've all been there. And if this is how you feel, you might be bowling in the wrong lane. Now the right lane is really different. It produces something totally different in our life. I love what Galatians 5.22, this is what bowling for the pins of grace produces in our life. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. This is a result of God being present. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I don't want you to just read that list and think that it's nothing. This is literally what happens when God is in your life. Everybody's all the time like, well, am I really a Christian? How do I know if I'm really a Christian? Like, this is what happens when you're following Jesus. These things overflow in your heart because of the presence of God. It's what the right lane looks like. When you're bowling in the right lane, you know everything's gonna be okay because God keeps his promises. People in the right, line, right lane have a resilient peace and confidence that God is imminent. People bowling in the right lane are emotionally robust and stable. They're able to forgive. They're focused on grace. Somebody does something in their life and they're not caught up in bitterness and how could she and how would she and why would they and I can't believe it and da 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 and No, it's just like, hey, I forgive you. I release the bitterness. Look, today there's a lot going on, but people bowling in the right lane stand with generations that have faced worse before us, and we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not, oh God, what's gonna happen to the world? God, I lift up the world to you. I trust it to you. I receive your promises, and I have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They turn on the news, and instead of being like, oh, they're like, hey God, I trust you, because you're bigger than the news. The problem with um, all the false lanes, the problem with all the false lanes is they result in us going for this, this sense of fairness and equality, right? In the lane of prosperity, if they have a nicer house, then I want a nicer house. In the lane of legalism, well, if she needs, if I wear a skirt, then she needs to wear a skirt. Or, um, you know, in the lane of uh, uh, progressivism, if I renounce my privilege, then they need to renounce their privilege. And the beautiful part about following Jesus is that we live for eternity, so we have more than enough, and we don't need to worry about, are they doing it too? We just give grace because we received it. We don't need to worry about justice and fairness because we have infinity. In the wrong lanes, we're worried about dealing with, you know, scarcity and getting fairness. And it's so unfulfilling because you can never make everything fair. But Jesus is so different. 
I love what Paul told the church in Corinth. This is kind of remarkable because the, the church in Corinth is arguing about, you know, legalism and they're arguing about, you know, I'm keeping the rules, but they're not. And the church in Corinth is kind of a, a great example of the modern era. If you, if you feel like your life is dysfunctional, read 1 Corinthians chapters one through six. It's like, man, they are, they got issues. But anyway, um, Paul tells him, he says, look, I'm the biggest victim ever. I've been beaten discriminated against, I faced racism, I've been shipwrecked and da, da 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 all this stuff. He goes, I'm the king of intersectionality. Nobody's a bigger victim than I am, but I don't win by being the biggest victim. I win by admitting that I'm the biggest sinner, by receiving God's grace in my life. And by doing that, I'm free from all that stuff in my past. Because ultimately what he's saying is, why care about equality when we have eternity? And he says, all of a sudden, it's not fair and all this stuff, and they got this and she got that first. It doesn't even matter because I have eternity in my life. If you're bowling in the wrong lane, the lane of legalism, the lane of progressivism, the lane of comfort and prosperity, get in the lane of grace. Because instead of worrying about equality, you can enjoy infinity in Christ Jesus. So I want to ask you, what lane are you bowling in, in your life? The thing is for me, even though I don't like admitting it, I have wasted years of my life, of my Christian life, bowling in the wrong lanes. And those are the areas I wish I could take back. Sometimes when I'm arguing with my, li- with my wife, I catch myself bowling in the wrong lane. Sometimes when I'm responding to an email, I catch myself bowling in the wrong lane and I got to delete that thing and, and start over again. What lane are you bowling in? In your marriage? With your extended family? inside your own head, with your boss, with your coworkers, with your children, with your parents, with your grandchildren? Why sit and worry about equality when you can live in eternity? Why sit and count and it's not fair and God, why would you, how could you when you have infinity promised by God in this life now? Eldon, my son, was bowling in the wrong lane, but he let his loving father correct and redirect him. And I think that some of us today might need to let your loving heavenly father correct and redirect you. Switching to the right lane begins with confessing that we are sinners. Bowling for the pins of grace, instead of looking, it just says, God, I am, I fall short of your standard. Like, I am a sinner, and I need your grace. Are you admitting regularly that you need a Savior? Are you admitting that you fall short of God's standard? You need grace. You're not the Savior of the world, but Jesus is. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. It is so easy to say, well, this lane makes sense and I get it and da 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 and this is, this is the lane that feels right for me, so I'm gonna bowl. It's so easy to do that. I think that's the big temptation. But he says, don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will. And it's not gonna feel natural. It's gonna feel unnatural. God is supernatural, but you seek his will in all you do. And he will show you then which path to take. And you gotta take that path. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what Christians are like. And if that's not what you're like, if that's not what you're like, what do you need to do to switch lanes? And for me, this is what I do. This is how I try to center my mind on the correct lane in the morning. How I try to really make sure I'm bowling for the pins of grace in the morning, okay? On the way from Demont Christian School to the church, driving myself without, you know, I drop my kids off, I just say this little short prayer. God, thank you for forgiving me. I wanna remind myself that I need forgiveness, right? That I am a sinner, that I fall short of God's glorious standard. God, will you forgive me? Thank you for forgiving me and help me to treat others the way that you've treated me. Simple prayer. That's how I live. I wanna challenge our church to do that this week. I think there's freedom in it. I think the pins of grace lead to freedom and joy and wonderful things in your life. I wanna challenge us to walk to it. As we close, please stand. And let's pray. God, as a church, We thank you for forgiving us. We admit that we fall short of your perfect standard. We thank you for having standards in the first place for our life. God, I ask that as a church, we would be focused on receiving your grace and giving it to others. God, I ask that as a church, we would treat others the way that you treated us. Thank you for loving us, for dying for us, for leading us. Help us walk in the lane of grace. In your name we pray, all God's people said amen and amen. Let's sing this last song together.